Welcome, everybody, back to Disclosure Team. I am Vinny. I'm with my wonderful co-host, Katie. Katie, how are you? I'm doing great, especially because we have an amazing setup of guests today. I know, right? This is something I've been looking forward to since it was even considered. And here we are. It's just an amazing feeling. Um, I will say, though, before we bring uh, our two guests on, couple of house rules as always everybody in the live chat thank you so much for being here really appreciate it um if you could just keep the chat cool calm and collected we would really appreciate that we appreciate that everybody has differences of opinion but we can still be respectful um and that's that's that so yeah um i i'm gonna say it. i am dealing with some pain right now i have a trap nerve in my shoulder hence the hot water bottle if i seem a little bit off at any point during the interview that's why um, but I've got my wonderful co-host here who will uh, keep things rolling. And yeah, Katie, anything you want to say before we uh, bring our guests some? No, I just want to uh, welcome them both. I think we haven't had the pleasure of having Tyler yet on a UFO podcast, if, I, if I'm correct. And so it's so great to have Tyler and Dr. Nolan here together. They are um, some of the most brilliant minds in our community and also some of the nicest people too. So uh, thank you both for being here. Let's bring them let's in. Bring them, let's bring them in. Please welcome Tyler Henry and Gary Nolan. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi, hi. Thank you for having us. I'm really excited to delve in today. Yes, same as well. And I apologize for reaching over. I've got to try to print something. So, yes, great to see you all. <laughs> it's Great wonderful. to have you Thank guys you so here. Much. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Katie, I'm going to let you kickstart the proceedings off. Excellent. So let's dive right in. I want to remind everyone that we're going to take it a little consciousness, a little woo. So uh, we hope that you guys will allow us to kind of go on this fun speculative journey here. And to kick it off, I'd like to talk about some what I call neuro spicy brains. Uh, you know, so brains that fall out of that typical middle chunk of the bell curve, so to say, and they are kind of a big question mark in UFO world. Uh, Gary, you've spoken a few times about your research with individuals who have diverse neurotypes. And Tyler, you've even had your brain scanned to kind of look at how it functions. Um, and I'm really curious to hear what role you both think that individual and atypical neurotypes may play when it comes to contact with the broader phenomenon? Uh, Tyler, why don't you start? Oh my goodness, well, what an <laughs> honor. <laughs> I think different people conjure different results. And one of the beautiful things about this work is I've seen how much diversity there is in the human experience and in how people connect with their own intuition, some naturally more than others. Um, I found in my work that I believe there's something to be said about thick boundary people and thin boundary people. And anthropologically, the work that's been done on trying to get an understanding of what that entails, I think speaks to people's receptivity often to connect to maybe those paranormal realms or that which may not be considered normal. <laughs> you know, I, I look at it as, let's say, a scientist or a geneticist as the, the diversity as evolution in play. Right, that you know, you need a diverse uh, number of types of people to deal with the complexity of the world. Um, but if everybody were to think the same way, uh, for instance, if, if everybody was a warrior, then all we would be doing is fighting. But I think, especially, and as it relates to the kind of discussion that I think we'll have here today. Um, the diverse neurotypes that, in fact, the ones that I'm most interested in are the so-called shamans or the priests or those who connect to that, uh, let's say, less observable realm that is something which is sort of supernature or, or, or beyond nature uh, and collecting information from that and using it for the more material aspects of the human condition. And so I've always been interested, first of all, in where this information comes from right? Uh, some call it the Akashic Record or, or something like that. Uh, but how do certain people accomplish this, right? How and where does information come from over there in a, mm -hmm. from a place that we don't understand what the information is and how it's organized to over here uh, into a place where, let's say, a scientist thinks of 
neurophysical connections and brain waves and things like that, that somewhere there's a connection. And, and we seem to see that it passes in families at times. So that means there's like a, there's an architecture or a blueprint in the genes that enables this. So I'm fascinated. They, they, it, it, it hypothesizes and spec, you know, the speculation is that this is how it, op it operates. So that's no, absolutely. my angle on it. Well, and he brought up an interesting point, Gary, about the uh, trying to understand where it comes from. And and Tyler, I'm interested in your take as someone who regularly interacts with the other side, um, whatever you want to call it, you know, how you see it. You know, people talk about the Akashic Wrecker, or quantum foam or, you know, literal heaven or, or, or whatnot. And I'm really curious how in, in your mind you um, you envision that and what it what it kind of appears to you as. Absolutely. Well, in my second book here and hereafter, I actually recently dedicated a whole chapter to that very thing. This idea that we may not always have to have an understanding of who the sign senders are, as much as there's value in recognizing the signs themselves. If you talk to different people, they'll acknowledge different things. Some feel they're connecting to non-human intelligence. Other people feel they're connecting to spirit guides. Some people feel they're only connecting to spirits themselves. And I've learned in this work that for me, it's less important about what's giving me the information and more about the information itself. Um, I find that there's something to be said about shamanism, its history in altered states of consciousness, and that perhaps being a fundamental that allows people to connect to whatever it may be that they identify it as. Yeah, and, okay. and Jung believed that the, the human mind retains this fundamental unconscious biological aspects of our ancestors, these primordial images uh, which he dubbed them as. So do you think that there is some logical foundation in, in that aspect of, of what he believes? Absolutely. I mean, oh, I sorry. So. Very... <laughs> no, go ahead. Anybody. Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. no, no. I just think with the collective unconscious, it speaks to that idea of Carl Jung's thoughts. I mean, the Mayans had uh, a concept around this as well that was almost identical to what we today call the Akashic Record. I mean, the Akashic Record... It, people often attribute to Hinduism. In fact, it's not. It's actually a more recent iteration of theosophy that uh, New Age philosophers have brought together. But it does slightly have a root in the word akasha, which is from the Sanskrit, which is basically the fundamental uh, field wherein reality and the ether sits. Now, it, it, it isn't a direct correlation, despite the similarity of the words. But here you have, going back as far as Sanskrit, you have the Mayans, uh, you do have uh, Hinduism having some um, elements of this. Uh, and I think there's a couple of others I was reading about the other day. And so, and of course you have today the, the collective unconscious, you have the so-called morphic field ideas, um, all of which are pretty much talking about the same thing again and again. And I, I think what that says is that humans are reaching for this concept because they realize that somewhere at the edge of the known is this unknown concept that we're all trying to put to words. Uh, but what I find fascinating in every aspect of this is that it's always the same kind of people who are in contact with it or who are doing the best description of it and are gathering information thereby. I mean, and so all I've ever been trying to do since I've only had very limited, let's say, um, experience personally in those things is, okay, how do I convince my fellow scientists that this is something worth studying? Um, you know, and I mean, there's the material scientists who do, but there's plenty of, plenty of psychiatrists and psychologists and even now quantum physicists who are more than willing to say, look, there's, a, there's an information field that we still don't understand yet. So it's just about trying to get that across the, the threshold for people to say, okay, now it's, how do we design experiments to look at it? You know, because at the end of the day, the, the public in general look to, for better or worse, scientists as the, as the validators of, of the, at least this century's realities. Yeah, no, I, I think you bring up some really great points. And, and one of the things you touched on that I would love to kind of dive a little more deeply into is uh, the role of psychedelics. Um, there's been a lot of research coming out, um, actually, even in the past couple of days, looking at the role of, you know, either psilocybin or DMT, which was used oftentimes, um, especially in uh, 
you know, uh, American indigenous communities uh, to kind of facilitate contact. And one of the things they found was that DMT actually changes kind of neurological pathways and how information is processed um, under the influence. And I'm really curious what you guys think of that, if you think there's a role for that um, in terms of, uh, you know, moving forward and understanding how consciousness, consciousness works and the phenomenon, or if you've had any personal experience, anything like that. I've had no personal experience personally with the psychedelics, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it isn't as if I'm not like reaching for the kitchen cabinet to maybe try it someday, but um, it's just not something that for any of a variety of reasons I, I, I can do. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what's important about, you know, to the extent that we understand anything about how the brain works and probably most people in the audience will know about something called the default mode network. The default mm -hmm. mode network, network can be simply thought of as, as the controller sitting at the middle of this cacophony of uh, processes that is basically putting its foot down and saying, this is how you're going to operate. And, and in some ways, it's almost like your executive function of who you are. And I, I mean, it's been clearly shown that these drugs uh, reduce the power or the strength and, or the hold of the default mode network and let the rest of the, uh, the, the orchestra, you know, come to the fore and, you know, put its, you know, put its thoughts forward. And I think what that does is it, it, it really, again, it, it, it allows for people who might be, as we started this whole thing off, neurodivergent to mm -hmm. let that, that uh, default mode network or stop it from working and let some of these other strengths play out. Uh, and then those are the things that are probably seeing uh, forms of reality that uh, some people would prefer not to see. Great. Great. Absolutely. What about and you, Tyler? Any thoughts? To speak to that, I, mean, I certainly see the value in neuroplasticity. And though in my own experience, I unfortunately don't have any experiences uh, regarding hallucinogens, I would say that, um, you know, for me, it, it does kind of go into the question of subjective versus objective. <laughs> and so many of these spiritual or uh, initiatory experiences are deeply subjectively meaningful. Um, my curiosity kind of sits in the objective realm of how do we take those experiences and quantify similarities if there are some, and it seems like there are in, in reading very little research on the subject. I you know, one, one of the thing interesting things are, are children, right? That um, right. children's default mode network is really actually not in play as much as an adult is. It's almost like that time at which your neuroplasticity in your brain locks down. Uh, and it's, it's almost coincident with the time that you stop being able to talk additional or learn additional languages. So that neuroplasticity, mm. uh, as you are entrained to enter whatever civilization or culture uh, and adulthood, is somehow coincident with the loss of those additional functions. And so I think, frankly, from a, again, a scientific standpoint, the fascinating thing to do would be to look at the brains of children as they mature from that, let's say, default mode, uh, less powerful stage of their life into something that has been more targeted, which is another reason why, actually, interestingly, the shamans who are trained in some of these tribal cultures, they're actually picked from very early on. And so you can imagine that that, let's say, entrainment stops them from becoming the warrior or stops them from becoming, mm -hmm. you know, some other uh, more dedicated subtype or, you know, utility in the tribe. Yeah, I think one thing that I found fascinating about when we hear about indigenous cultures from all around the globe is that people have used psychedelics to contact loved ones, lost or, or ancestors. But at the same time, we hear of them contacting the star people and that. So I, I find that just fascinating that it's not just one thing, that there is some some broader spectrum of, of being able to contact more than just one thing in another realm. I just mm -hmm. find that fascinating. Absolutely. There, there's a book, a wonderful book called The Ritual Process by Victor Turner, where he covers in depth uh, some of the traditions and uh, cultural aspects of African tribes and found that liminality seemed to go hand in hand with rites of passage. And that rites of passage in people's lives individually seemed to often open them up to things that perhaps they weren't 
ordinarily connected to. And that seemed to be kind of the goal of taking people out of their traditional societies, sometimes going into the desert or going to the forest alone and having to mm -hmm. kind of go from a boy to a man. And in that process, going back and returning with knowledge that is yeah. received in that state that helps better society as a whole. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things about many now of the psychedelics that's been observed is the induction of neuroplasticity that happens. They actually induce mm -hmm. brain changes. I mean, that's just, to me, right. I mean, that was only been observed, I think, in the last couple of years. It's shocking that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it used to be that the brain was thought to be something set in stone and there was no such thing as a brain stem cell. Well, that all changed, mm -hmm. you know, about a decade or so ago. And now we find these drugs that seem to not only open individuals' minds to alternative views of reality and contact with mm -hmm. other things, allegedly. Um, I'm always going to use allegedly, even though everybody on the, in the audience who knows me knows that I'm just saying that for my scientist <laughs> friends. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so they contact these other things. And so, you know, the, the open question is, does use of these inalterably change your brain? But then it's mm. kind of a global effect. I mean, people take these things and it's systemically applied. Imagine if right. we understood enough about it so that you could locally apply these uh, neurogenerative uh, uh, drugs to areas that were either missing individuals because of some pathology or because they decide to change how they want their brain to function, right? Sort of a, mm -hmm. a, a, a decision they make to, to do something. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things that I, I've often talked with to people about is when, you know, sometimes people who suddenly appear to, uh, gain function they they have an accident they gain a function suddenly they can do something they couldn't do before and then people say well how does this happen and the only way that i as a say a, a, a biologist could imagine is what happened was that you damaged a part of the brain the the neuroregenerative process of the brain basically created circuits around the damage and mm. in so doing connected networks that previously had been suppressed or just didn't exist, and suddenly now they have access to, you know, they, somebody rewired their brain because of the damage. So the damage, right. in fact, did not, did, it didn't, didn't mystically cause some change. It actually physically caused a change that allowed their brain to function in a wholly new manner. Wow, and that, that really speaks to the evidence that we've seen, at least anecdotally, where people right. have shared after the loss of a loved one, after a serious illness, even sometimes during pregnancy, mm -hmm liminal times in people's lives where they have to approach things differently by force and then end up kind of opening or unlocking a whole other side of themselves that perhaps they didn't recognize at the time. Did you know that in pregnancy, yeah. the, the baby's cells can actually uh, enter the woman and take and actually uh, become part of the woman? You literally become part of mm -hmm. a, a colleague of mine showed some early data that actually uh, some uh, brain cells appear to be contributed to by the by the baby's fetal cells that are get around. It's still a bit wow, controversial, all the way to the brain, all the way to the brain. Yeah, well, is that, yeah, it's wow. fascinating. So, I mean, oh, that's amazing. Of, let's look at childbirth. That's the most alien process in the world. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Let's not look at childbirth right now. No, I'm just that's kidding. right for the sake of keeping breakfast down. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, before no, we get to the I next mean... question, sorry, Katie, I just wanted to say to everyone, I am recording a few questions that people have, uh, have asked in the chat. We will get to, the, to any questions towards the end, and anybody that's kindly donated as well, I will read those out towards the end. I just wanted to let people know I'm not ignoring everybody. So, sorry, Katie, continue. Thank you. That's what Vinny says. He's messing with you all. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so Tyler, you actually kind of, I think you read my mind because the next question I was going to ask both of you about um, <laughs> was, was George Hansen the tricks from the paranormal? Yeah, I, I guess there was, that was kind of a joke in there. I didn't even intend it. Um, <laughs> so George Hansen, if you guys haven't read the tricks from the paranormal, fantastic book, highly recommend it. Um, and he kind of famously outlines the role of liminality, but also some other things like anti-structure in attracting paranormal activity, high strangeness, whatever you want to call it. And I'm curious if you found this to be something that actually has impacted your lives personally. You know, Tyler, you as a medium, Gary, you know, you've had some experiences yourself. Um, or if these are states that you actively seek in order to sort of better tune in or have these experiences and what your thoughts are. 
Absolutely. I know in my own work, liminality is a goal that I try to kind of um, implement a state of when I do a reading. Now, getting a reading by default is liminal. There is kind of the expectations and then the suspension of those expectations. You never know what's going to be said. People are kind of on edge. And that creates a liminal environment where I believe the paranormal can kind of flourish. But I found, interestingly, that a lot of my uh, live shows will be actually sometimes around environments of play. Sometimes they're at resorts where people are relaxing and having fun and coming from other places. And if you've read the book, you know, that's a very liminal descriptor. So I find that where there is kind of a convivial uh, Bacchanalian like environment, oftentimes the paranormal seems to meet that and it's fertile soil. So I find that to be in coincidental at the very least. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You, I mean, I, I, I almost hesitate to talk about it, but I was on a, a cruise actually recently. It was actually a gay cruise um, with like, it was a lot of fun in the, in the Caribbean. Yeah. I think I sent a couple of pictures of it to Tyler um, of the, uh, of the Bacchanal. It was a lot of fun. But so um, we had handed out um, these like little dog tags that basically said, you know, give our number if we met somebody fun and we wanted to see them again because there's 5,000 people on the ship and God knows you ever find them. So I get this text like on uh, like partway through saying, hey, Gary, um, don't know who, you, you know, we, we found this dog tag of yours. Um, do you want it? Thinking that it was something important. And I said, no, no, it's not. It's okay. It's just something we, we hand out. Three nights later, I'm out literally on the dance floor with friends. And we come across these couple of guys who we had we we met and had a lot of fun with, and um, they said, "Hey, this is a lot of fun. You know, hope to see you tomorrow. Can I take your number?" They start typing my number in, and it was the guys who had found the dog tag, almost as if out of time, I, they had been sent the dog tag because they were the people that I was going to meet, right? And this was like out of five thousand yeah. people, and the only people, you know, and so it was like one of those synchronistic moments that you realize okay this was something that needs to be remembered you know it was that continual mm -hmm. uh remembrance and the, the the pattern of what jacques valet would frankly call the control theory the the mm -hmm. re reminding you that you are as much in almost in control of what's happening to in your life but that it is an out of time and out of context uh um set of events it, it just it was that's like the most recent i would say paranormal i mean sure i could always put it off to coincidence etc but it was just a little too much for me and in a yeah. in a good way yeah, I, that's one thing i'd say I about synchronicity i found recently since i've been quite active in this community publicly and some of the friends that i've made recently and they have brought up these synchronicities that happen to them all the time but since getting to know them I find that the synchroni synchronicities happen to me a lot more and is yes. that just because I'm looking out for it sure. like I'm very cautious to think that there's something spooky going on but at the same time I just don't know so yeah I'm in that kind of weird frame of mind with that at the moment it, it seems well, to be something around meaningful coincidences I'm sorry Gary I didn't mean to no no it's the same thing I was just going to say Carl Jung wrote a book yeah. about it or Exactly. And, and those meaningful coincidences, I suspect, perhaps might lead to the future communicating with the past. And I've wondered how that ties in with something mm -hmm. called retrocausality, which mm -hmm. is a lot of recent work in. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on retrocausality, if you have any other. Oh, goodness. That's above my pay grade. I think Dr. Gary <laughs> Nolan might have some thoughts uh, on that one. Well, yeah, Gary, I, what do you think oh, about the, the past and future? I'll get you for that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, well, you know, um, again, if you if you dive into the people who do all of the physics of reality, they, uh, you know, th they don't have any problem with time having no arrow. And uh, so, you know, there's plenty of ways that you can construct reality in that way. And and, you know, but then there's does does consciousness follow the arrow uh, or does it at times of necessity Need to step outside or use, you know, a you know multi-directional arrow to uh, to, you know, make some important change in your life. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that, that's the you know, I don't have you know back to another question here. I don't have any of the kinds of on-call experiences that many people do. I mean, I've had my experiences, and I almost feel like whatever is behind the scenes has sort of said, 
well, I don't need to spend any more time with this guy. He's convinced. <laughs> <laughs> right. So why, yeah. why, uh, apart from the occasional reminder, uh, we don't have to put orbs in his house to remind him that this is something worth, you know, worth spending time on. Um, cause maybe that will just distract him. So, uh, you know, but, but the one time that I did manage to sort of go into the kind of meditation, uh, efforts that I know, uh, Tyler does on a more regular basis, um, was the time when I had that experience in London where, you know, that kind of buzzing in my body and then this voice in my head saying, this is how you connect. Um, I've never been able to recreate that. But mm -hmm. frankly, I haven't done the kind of meditative stuff uh, that got me to that point in the first place because I was so frightened by what happened. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe that's something. But, you know, is it is it something that we want everybody to experience might be, a you know, is is that what the collective unconscious of humanity needs to move beyond our current stalemates. Uh, and so I, 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 I wonder if, but we're, we're, we're actually seeing that, let's say collective unconscious expand in society as it is. I mean, you know, these psychedelics are being used now therapeutically. Uh, it, people are talking about them on a more regular basis. So, how many more people now might be able to legally experience it that we right. then reach an inflection point, uh, which is sort of a, let's call it a positive upgrade for uh, human collective unconscious. Uh, and that's actually where I, I'm most excited. I'm actually working with a couple of people of considerable means who are literally building companies around this to get it out, at least as therapeutics. Uh, and to engage uh, the political establishment uh, in positive senses, uh, not just the doctors, but also the, the politicians, just as we've been doing with UAPs. You know, we've mm -hmm. been engaging the, the politics because through the politics and scientists, we engage the public. And so there's a very much a parallel track. And in fact, the, con the conversation I've had with some of these people is we're going to we're going to help you with the UAP because we already have the kinds of experience of how to get this across the Rubicon with psychedelics because we see an exact parallel. So that's, I, I think that's interesting that you see those, those two things going hand in hand, which is frankly why you see Tyler and I sitting here next to each other, albeit 900 miles away. That's right. You, you made a full <laughs> circle. We came full circle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, no, but you, you brought up a good point and, you know, we are principally a UAP podcast. So, you know, one of the things that Vinny and I are very interested in, and I'd love to hear from both of you about is the role that consciousness does, um, uh, supposedly perhaps maybe speculatively play in contact experiences and experiences with UAP. Um, you know, there are lots of folks who are very much in the nuts and bolts camp and they believe that UAP are only nuts and bolts. They're something you can touch and that's it. There are other folks that believe it's purely in your consciousness. There's folks that are in the middle who believe it's some sort of fusion of the two. And I'd love to really hear your guys' thoughts on that. Um, if you want to talk about any experiences you've had too, that's great, but um, really just what do you, what are your speculative thoughts? No one knows the truth for sure, you, but you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he's getting you, know, you back. There's definitely something to be said about CE five. You know that being kind of one of the obvious mm -hmm. things that comes to mind, where there are some who believe that through certain methodologies they can make contact uh, with UFOs. I'm not endorsing that or discrediting that, but I would say uh, when it comes to looking at historical parallels, I think of iconic figures like Jack Parsons, who used ritual magic to try to commune uh, with Venusians. Um, if you go further back, I think you could look at a lot of religious leaders and spiritual leaders who were in contact with something. And even when they attributed that something to a certain deity, if you look at the evidence, it's not always super clear. I, I think back to uh, the instances of when people were seeing images of the Mother Mary in the sky, the uh, Fatima inc incident, if, if I recall. Mm -hmm. um, those are all things where people saw what they thought they were seeing, but perhaps there was something more to that, or archetypally something to be said about um, the Mother archetype as it even pertains to the Bledsoe's, as if we're familiar with their story of kind of the divine mm -hmm. feminine. So it all, I think, kind of ties in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's hardly a 
UAP UFO contact story that doesn't involve lack of verbal communication and always mm -hmm. seems to have some sort of consciousness to consciousness communication. And so, I mean, as a data point, I mean, all of these, as I've, I've said before, are anecdotes, but, and so from a, again, from a scientific standpoint, individual anecdotes are not that useful, but collectively, uh, when this seems to happen again and again and again, you, you can't help but, sorry, <laughs> a colleague of mine, um, a very good colleague, uh, you, you can't help but say, uh, all right, this is, this is a pattern. Um, here you have these so-called entities, however you, however they are representing themselves as Venusians, Palladians, you know, future humans, et cetera. There's always, they're never speaking. They're always thinking at you. And so that's a consciousness to consciousness interaction. And so again, it's, I think hearkening back to something Tyler was saying before, it doesn't matter whether it's guides or you or your, you know, uh, your brain system creating these objects. It's always, a, it, it, it ends up in your consciousness, but not mm -hmm. as a way that, that it was received materially through the, through sound in your ears. And, mm -hmm. and so I just find that, I don't know, I find that fascinating. And, and, there's there's an agreement that it happens, but there's no agreement on how to study the fact that it does happen and 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 how that information. I mean, where does it come? I mean, Tyler and I actually um, had a discussion about this, you know, a few months ago of does the does the impression come in through a single neuron or does it come through mm. the process, like the visual process? So Tyler, for instance, gets a visual. Uh, mm -hmm. and then he interprets those symbols. So, okay, fine. How the heck does a complex symbol, I would call it a <laughs> glyph, impose itself on a person's right. sensory apparatus? Uh, and, you know, probably different people have differently, differently evolved or constructed sensory apparatus. So that is the best means through which the signal might arrive. So I just, right. you know, it's a complex signal. It's not like a it's not like a, a Morse code that then you decode into a paragraph and then you interpret the paragraph. It's a the one time I did a remote viewing with a very well known person who does who basically was part of the remote viewing program. Um, mm -hmm. The signal I got was a gestalt, and it was an image that was extraordinarily accurate. And but it was a gestalt, huh. and so I've I've wondered about that. How does the gestaltic in Pingement occur. I, I, I don't know. So, but again, it's just, it's, it's raw data and no, none of my scientist friends would, would put up with me talking about it, <laughs> except over uh, a few martinis. <laughs> nice, very nice. I think one thing that I find fascinating is you can take it a step further because Tyler, in some of your work, that you actually talk about physical reactions that come through as well. So that almost takes it from something that's happening in the brain and manifests into some kind of physical. Uh, feeling that you get. Uh, I just wondered if you could just sort of talk on that a little bit. Absolutely. In a reading, I really kind of liken my body to a canvas. And to give you the visual, it's almost like the consciousness coming through paints the picture of what they need me to know, be it through my body, be it through my mind. But it all really originates in the mind is, is really my belief as far as how that information is being perceived. So uh, as I go through these processes, I have to interpret what I'm getting, deliver it in a way that can make uh, some sense. But I've often wondered the relationship between electrical activity and the paranormal. I know so little about mm. neurology, so please understand that it is above my pay grade. But I've seen even in the tropes of the paranormal, you know, lights flickering on and off, or they somehow being able to affect car engines, as we've seen in countless UFO reports where engines suddenly mm. seem to stall. If that is possible, I have wondered if the electrical signals within a person's brain might not be able to be tinkered with mm. in such a way to facilitate certain sensations or imagery. I don't know, but it's something I've considered. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the complexity of, of how many places they must be able, again, speculation, mm. the complexity of, of all the different places that they must 
be able to tickle simultaneously to create <laughs> a a signal is just mind boggling. Because again, it's not that kind of linear Morse code. It's just this flash. Uh, and so yeah, the best word I can come up with is, is like a glyph that is passed from one mind to another, a complex mm -hmm. uh, representation of symbols that then is up to, and even the remote viewing community would say, it's up to then the, the interpreter to try not to interpret at the beginning, to make sure that they accept the symbol, uh, write it down as quickly as possible. And then, and then as Hal Putoff would say, try to prevent the overlay of your cultural traditions from interpreting the, the signal to, uh, in too much of a biased manner. Right. Right. And you, since you're bringing up, you know, remote viewing, I know that's something that you both have dabbled in. I'm really curious if you see a connection between remote viewing and the phenomenon and the, uh, in, in the sense that the same processes may be utilized or, Perhaps um, we could use remote viewing to um, promote contact or anything like that. Just any thoughts you may have on that matter. Sure. I would say in my own work, one of the most fascinating parts of, for example, having a premonition is that it seems that if a premonition is real, if I can sit in one space and get an inclination of what may happen in two weeks or three weeks, and if that it does indeed happen, that in my mind is the future calling out to the past. It very clearly indicates that our linear understanding of time is at the very least very complicated. There's a lot to be understood um, in that realm. So I think it speaks to the fact that we are probably a lot more connected to one another than we realize. For a medium to be able to sit with somebody and get a very specific understanding of someone's last words as if they were the ones speaking them, that speaks to the fact that consciousness awareness is something not necessarily unique to our bodies, that I believe we can connect to other people's consciousness and they can connect to ours under the right mm -hmm. circumstances, which then, if you kind of zoom out, might speak to the fact, and this is getting very, very speculative, but perhaps we are all part of the same thing. Perhaps there is a collective consciousness mm -hmm. that exists and we are little drops of water that kind of become part of a vast ocean of consciousness upon physical death. Fascinating. You know, I remember that moment when you know, Kit Green, Jacques, and I, along with Hal and Eric Davis, we're all sitting in a room looking at these brain scans of the individuals who I've talked about uh, long and, and often. Um, and that area of the brain that we saw, which at the center of the basal ganglia, the caudate putamen. Mm -hmm. And we were like, this seems to be in a lot of these people. And then I, mean, I think it was Hal who said, can you bring up the scans of a couple of you know, high-end remote viewers that we have who had not been damaged. They just, we happened to have their scans, uh, Kit Green. And lo and behold, they had that, that density in spades. Um, and that was the moment of clarity, literally for me. It was like, wait a second, the connection is intuition. This is, this is an area that is uh, somehow consolidating or taking the information from all areas of the brain and consolidating it, and that the better your processing center, the more simultaneous processors you can run, the more you can intuit per unit time. Um, and it actually wasn't until I found, I started then looking at all of the books or all of the, okay, well, is, the, is this area of the brain related to, um, to psi? Right, what is the words? Mm -hmm. And the only words you can, I mean, the, the areas of the brain are basically the pineal gland. And when I came up mm -hmm. with a, a search of, of this woman's book and then read the, you know, the content of what she was saying here, who was a famous medium from uh, literally 30, 40 years ago, she literally called out the caudate patamen as the, as the center really? of, of these processes. I mean, this is literally two years after I was born, she had already called out this area of the brain as being important for intuition. And only wow. um, only in the last five years have people accepted that the basal ganglia is involved in anything other than motor function. I mean, she's got this whole section here of these night visions and night dreams and classes she would go through. Have you read this, Tyler? I never have, but I am now. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's absolutely... It, I mean, she uses mostly the, you know, um, 
Hindu interpretations of it, which is fine, mm -hmm. but she literally calls out the caudate uh, as being the center of future uh, evolution for human consciousness. And she basically calls it the antenna. Wow. And I remember when I found that, I was like, I, I was like, okay, this has got to be, this is way more, again, this is a synchronistic moment. You know, it's proof of nothing, except yeah. that then we went and did the, we actually did the, the retrospective and prospective analyses of brain regions with this Harvard group and we published on, lo and behold, the caudate is exactly as we predicted it. And then about probably two dozen other researchers about the same time have been pointing out this area as being important for that um, distilling of the complex information and then represent, it's called the brain within the brain. I mean, this is the brain within, this is what the, what, what scientists call it now, the brain within the brain is this processing center. Um, so anyway, um, that to me is, so I, you know, I, you know, I joked with Tyler about it. I'm going to put him under, you know, in this kind of Frankensteinian <laughs> device and look at him. Not concerning know, at all. Microscope. No, not no. On my good side. If we're going to assemble me together. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, <laughs> To, you know, but to measure the, you know, the what happens in the brains of someone like, sorry, Tyler, for using as the guinea pig here. Uh, what happens in the brains of someone like Tyler when they are achieving that moment, both before and after. Right. And um, and so to me, that is, you know, there's I just find it fascinating, you know, uh, to be able to to eventually do with permission. Absolutely. Now, there's so much should be said about altered states of consciousness. I'd be fascinated to, to see what yeah. happens in that area of research. Yeah, I have about 35 follow up questions, but <laughs> I'm going to limit it to a two part question. Um, OK, so the first one I had you kind of touched on, Gary, is you talked about prospective and, and you know, retrospective studies. Have they looked at the temporal relationship between the caudate putamen and intuition, meaning are folks who naturally have a higher density having these these result these experiences as a result, or is it a neuroplasticity neuroplast relationship where people who have been remote viewing for years develop a higher density? Have they looked at all at that? I don't know. No one's done anything like that. Um, I mean, okay. all that has been done is, and, and I've, I've talked about this publicly, is that there's if you do functional MRI and you look at the area of the brain that's using sugar through functional MRI, that's kind of what it's doing is saying there's energy usage here. Um, chess players in Japan, it's using a sort of a simplified version of chess. When they make that unexpectedly brilliant move that is not linear, this is the area of the brain that lights up. Um, okay. and, uh, and again, there've been now numerous studies that basically show that whatever intuition is, uh, the caudate plays a very large role in it. I mean, the studies that we've published on now show that, frankly, it's not just the caudate. I mean, you you can't just produce or receive more information in one area of the brain unless there's a unless there's a, a, a receiver in the other area of the brain that's capable of either right. delivering or or receiving and processing that data. So what we find is that there are the, the neuronal tracts that go between the caudate basal ganglia to other areas of the brain, memory, emotion, et cetera, are reciprocally uh, either increased or decreased in these individuals. So it's not a single area of the brain that is important. Uh, it actually is a network uh, that must be, that in some ways is compensatory. And frankly, again, loops back to the, the beginning of what the title of your podcast, it's all about the neurotypes that there's many different ways to structure the brain to frankly accomplish the same goal. It doesn't mean that you have to look like this to have that. There's probably many ways. I mean, in, in my cancer work, it's all about the networks and how networks process information and can, and can one compensatory node can, can deal with a defect elsewhere. Um, and so, but what's good about that is what's interesting about networks is uh, without getting too biological, if you have a complex protein structure of multiple proteins, it turns out that you can make a drug against many of those different proteins, each of which will accomplish the goal that you're seeking, which is to either anti-cancer or turn something on or turn something off. So similarly, if you think about that as a net, there's many strings on the network you can pluck to perhaps change 
consciousness functions in ways that are useful. Or in the case, I think, of some people, and I've said this before, who, let's say, uh, some people who might end up with mental health issues because they just don't know how to turn it off. They're just receiving too much information. Yeah. And so, you know, how do we help people like that and not think of them as having mental health problems, but they're basically just more aware of the universe uh, in its in its naked power than some of the rest of us are. Yeah. You know, and, I, mean, I mean, to that is, point, uh, Hoffman's out there saying that basically we only need to see enough to pass on our genes. Right. We don't need to see it all. And mm -hmm. if we did, we'd probably you know, dissolve, you know, in a, in a, go ahead, Tyler. I, I lo love that you said that because I'm curious as far as, as it pertains to gay people and there being mm -hmm. something to be said about a higher prevalence mm -hmm. of gay people or people who are questioning or fall somewhere in that middle ground um, that are open to intuitive faculties, developing them themselves. Mm -hmm. I've wondered if that's nature versus nurture, if gay people might mm -hmm. have early experiences of being rejected by traditional religion and therefore might embrace alternatives and perhaps that need mm -hmm. to be true one is allows them to explore new possibilities that right. perhaps others aren't. However, I'm not necessarily sold on that idea. I've really genuinely wondered if there is something to be said about our makeup informing our barrier thickness sometimes. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Mm. No. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I've, I've, I've wondered it myself and it would, I, I, I always try to shy away from it because it sounds too much like, you know, one is patting oneself on the back. Um, and I want to try to, you know, stay away from that. But I mean, it certainly is true. You know, I don't think this is, this is uh, um, being, uh, I don't know, uh, bigoted in any way. You know, it's, it's pretty clear that amongst uh, the, you know, the, let's say the, the more gender fluid, there is more creative uh, impulse and allowance. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're allowed to step outside of the boundaries. I mean, the best science, I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, gay or gender or anything. The best science is always when you are, you allow yourself to see beyond the walls of what somebody else previously defined for you. And so right. to the extent that any of us through whatever experiences in our lives, whether it's being gay or something else, you know, being a woman dealing uh, with a man's world or frankly being a certain kind of man and dealing with a man's world and not wanting to mm -hmm. conform to ultra masculine uh, stereotypes. Um, you know, th th that for everybody is a way to step beyond the walls. Right. And, and it kind of in, inducts, inducts, induces some of that, that liminal thinking and that anti-structure that we were talking about earlier, you know, mm -hmm. so Absolutely. whether like mm -hmm. could be a part of the, part of the equation too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at Jung as well and his archetypes, he introduces sexuality into some of his archetypes quite, quite frequently. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it does all intertwine in the way that the, of the things that we're discussing. So I find that really fascinating. Absolutely. Even looking at Greek and Roman archetypes of Hermaphroditus, this kind of amalgamation mm -hmm. of Hermes and Aphrodite, you have very masculine and very feminine, you have the trickster and, uh, you know, that aspect all kind of put together in this gender neutral or at least fluid, ambiguous landscape. And that really, I think, is the key word, ambiguity. So much mm -hmm. of the paranormal is ambiguous. Some people revel in those ambiguous areas like myself, and then others find ambiguity absolutely terrifying and something to be destroyed. So it speaks <laughs> to the, the uh, right. diverse human experience. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, Vinny, do you maybe want to uh, take us over to some viewer questions? I know we're getting close on time here and I want to sure, sure, yeah. We... That's absolutely yeah i'm going to give a quick shout out to a couple of people who have donated so uh papa beth thank you so much for the donation and owen from ohio thank you so much daniel bogazuski thank you so much and then mr calhoun thank you again with a question for gary what is gary's interpretation of eric w davis's claims that the immune system acts like an antenna to the phenomena is he implying that the phenomena works like the force star wars through some kind of midichlorians <laughs> you know, that those midichlorians always made my skin crawl the, the, <laughs> it was like when in et they come screaming out of the tent he's got dna he's got dna right. like ah, ah. um 
actually, uh, it wasn't Eric Davis. Uh, it was actually um, Colin Kelleher. Uh, Eric has uh, repeated that, but you know, it was actually one of the white papers that um, ASWAP or ATIP uh, wrote. And the, the idea was not so much that it was somehow purposefully listening the immune system. It's just that the inflammatory processes are like one of the first things that happen when you're challenged, uh, at mm -hmm. least bodily. You know, uh, so the immune system is the first place where what are called literally alarmins. You cut yourself and alarmins get released. They're generically called alarmins, but they're things like cytokines and things like that, that basically are telling the immune system, come. Um, and to a certain extent, there are, let's say, short-term memory in the immune system. And then there's long-term memory. Uh, long-term memory are like B cells and T cells. Um, and so it was that original paper that they had written that caused them and others to come to my office that day when they were looking oh. for somebody to help them with studying the people who'd been hurt. Not because I had any special knowledge of brain, but because the immune system was something that I specialized in. And at the time, and actually still we have and had the best immune system analysis tool for looking at things. And so they were really following up on some of the earlier stuff that that Eric, well, Colm and, and Eric had been involved themselves with. You know, a lot of people, and I'm just going to say this, a lot of people said that, you know, they were trying to use people as guinea pigs. That is absolutely incorrect. The, the thing was to say was that if there has been evidence or if there are interactions, to the extent that we can, uh, you know, make, make use of that information, um, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's, let's collect that data as we can. But when, no one, no one ever was 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 saying, "Let's put people out in the middle of the field, tie them to a stake, and wait for the UAPs to come." <laughs> That's next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Oh for that. my goodness. Um, my next question comes from Benji, and this is both for, for Tyler and Gary. Um, why are Western societies, religious and the medical scientific bodies, so resistant to factor in Eastern practices, i.e. meditation, spiritual practices, chakra systems, etc.? Tyler, you start. I've chatted enough here. Well, again, I think that that is a subject that spans philosophy, sociology, anthropology as to where those differences lie. Um, in the Eastern versus Western mindsets. I would say, I think that we have a more capitalistic, materialist-based society in the West, and that certainly seems to inform certain aspects of what people prioritize, what they're open to, and what they're not. Um, I think, you know, there has been this idea that we can't be comfortable with ambiguity uh, in a lot of cases. And again, I'm very comfortable with ambiguity. When we talk about Eastern medicine, Western medicine, I always like to view it as complementary, not that necessarily there is one or the other, but that in the accordance of both, that there can be harmony. Um, but again, that makes people very uncomfortable. People want one or the other, black or white. And the paranormal and much of what even I do, I believe exists in that gray area that is just a characteristic of the phenomenon. I think luckily the line is moving. I mean, you know, you can look at, I mean, at Stanford, we, we you know, they do, you know, they stick, they stick pins in people, you know, <laughs> is something that 10, 20 years ago was laughed at, right? I mean, there are, you know, in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, and I'm good friends with the chair, she actually used to literally live right next door to me until recently. Um, you know, they, they use uh, Eastern traditions, they are uh, in some of the psychiatric uh, work, they're, they're investigating the use of psychedelics which is right out of shamanic traditions. I mean, every one of those psychedelics came from shamans. Uh, and so I think it's because the evidence is pointing to some inherent truthfulness here. And so, you know, I, I think in the best of scientific traditions to give, let's say, credit to Western uh, um, society being willing to start to be open to this sort of stuff, there is an, there is an, a, 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 an, an openness that is expanding. Um, and so I'm quite happy for that. I mean, is it gonna happen like that? No, because many of the claims of, let's say the some of the new age philosophies are a little bit beyond, but there's enough truth in them that some people like me and others are paying attention and saying, okay, well, how can I, 
how can I turn this from liminal to fact? Interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, next question I've got. In fact, I'm just going to give a quick shout out. Carolina, thank you so much for the donation. And Melody as well. Really appreciate it. Uh, I've got a question here for Tyler from Your Nay. She says, Dear Tyler, I want to thank you for being a great teacher for me and having this gift. I used to be so scared and now I understand. How was it for you in the beginning and how did you find the understanding? Love you. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate that. You know, I think we all have intuitive faculties. We all have an inner tuition. And I think we can see that from when we shake someone's hand and get a first impression to when our little dog is perhaps looking at us and we got to kind of intuit, okay, is that the food look or that I got to go potty look? Um, you know, we use intuition <laughs> on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And so I think for me, getting understanding was really a process of trust in my own experience. People often ask if I had mentors and I really have found that the greatest mentor has been trying to delve deeper into self-awareness, to try to become more of myself, to be familiar with myself creatively. And the more I've done this, the more I've kind of created an inner world that allows me to navigate the outer world uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the beauty of experiencers, whether they are medium experiencers, UFO experiencers, I think we all can relate to that feeling of divisiveness, of not being necessarily understood by others, but work is being done. And I think owning your experiencing and sharing it is is a, a start in getting acceptance yeah yeah thank you for that now um and then i have I'm, a Vinny. On, i just had an anonymous question on, yeah. pop in here is okay if i do okay go um, for it okay so this person's a little shy and uh, they said tyler i haven't seen any interviews before where you discussed why you are interested in ufos uh how does that connect to your work as a medium and could you tell us a little more about that Sure. Well, I would say it just kind of speaks to this idea of never being fully certain of what you're communicating with, right? And I think that as I've done now thousands and thousands of readings, I've had my own questions. It seems that, mm -hmm. at least in my case, what I do is only made possible by these things that I call my guides. I don't consider what I have to be a gift. I don't even necessarily view what I do to be inherent to me as much as it is inherent to them who have followed me throughout my life. And without them, I would be nothing. So. Uh, yeah, there's certainly something to be said about the questions that presents, and naturally I've considered non-human intelligence as being uh, a, something there that is responsible. You know, I think Diana Pasolka uh, wrote American Cosmic, kind of went through a moment like this, where she realized that the, the divine ecstasies that she was studying of the saints had similarities to so-called UFO experiences. And then she explored that. I mean, science uh, is, uh, or anything, is all about looking for parallels. And those parallels help you create, uh, let's say, a mathematical set of principles that are more general, that, it, that can explain more things. I mean, frankly, that's what, the, that's what physicists are looking for, the theory of everything. You know, I remember the moment in time when I was looking at UFO stuff and then realizing, oh, my God, this is somehow related to mediums and poltergeists and uh, I wait I just I just believed in all of this I can't believe in all of that you know and then boom, we've all been there yeah it's kind of like okay it's but it's 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 a relationship it's not a truth that it's the same and so um it doesn't mean that they're the same it just means that there are similarities absolutely yeah, absolutely I uh, just want to give a quick shout out here to Science Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Says, congratulations, Vinny and Katie. What a wonderful panel and topics. Thank you so much, Bob. We love you. Now, Gary, it would be remiss of me and I would get brutalized in the UFO community if I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> you always seem to, I know, you always seem to have the um, conversations behind the scenes. And recently we've heard inklings of potential new public hearings. And I just wondered if there was anything you could, you know, Tell us about that. Have you heard anything behind the scenes? Well, I mean, behind the scenes, yes. Uh, there, you know, but I mean, I don't even have to go behind the scenes. I mean, it's public information now that mm -hmm. several of the Congress people have talked openly about, you know, literally going to the Speaker of the House, uh, McCarthy, and and asking for these open hearings. Yeah. Um, you know, we all know that the, some of the whistleblowers have stepped forward and done all of this and uh, and, and talked about this. And, you know, I mean, I have a I have a letter signed by 12 senators saying, you know, we're, we're doing this. 
right? I mean, I, I know Love as it. well behind the scenes of some of the heads of the intelligence agencies and DOD who've literally said, I mean, I won't repeat it because I've been asked not to, but some <laughs> astounding, astounding conclusions. Oh my God, mm -hmm. Ali, I will call you, I promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, <laughs> He's a very good. He's a very good colleague. Has a fantastic, basically, cure for some cancers. Um, so you can you, know, I, you I, can pick I, up I, the phone. It's okay. No, it's okay. It's we, we've, we've known each other for forty years. He can he can wait. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that I think people just need to look three months ago as to how far it's come, and just take heart in the knowledge that there's a lot of people who have who have crossed over that threshold of wanting to move it forward. You know, but I mean, right. back to this conversation here, <laughs> everybody involved knows that it's not just the nuts and bolts. Yeah. And yet we're, we're being very careful, not dancing too far over that line because it will scare the bejesus right. out of, out of people. Right. Um, if it gets too deep into the woo, you know, and so, and yet all of us know that the woo is just around the corner. <laughs> they can find that out on their own later. They can find it, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you answering that. I, I, like I said, I would have got crucified if I didn't at least uh, mm -hmm. try. So thank you so much. You, you saved my bacon. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask gonna one little follow-up question, though. Please, Gary. please do. Last time we, we found out that you may have been involved in some prep materials. You may have helped Mike Gallagher find out about the Wilson Davis memo, which got in entered into the record. Um, can you say if you will be participating in any sort of briefings or providing white papers to any members of Congress beforehand? I just shouldn't say anything. Okay. I've been asked, you know, I mean, I, I think people can infer exactly what I mean when I say that. So, um, you know, you uh, I, I, am, I am certainly not central to the ongoing narrative. Uh, and it could happen and continue without me. Um, to the extent that I can help, I'm there. Got Wonderful. it. Understood. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to give a quick shout out here to Jordan Flowers. Jordan says, sending my gratitude to all of you for helping to advance this topic in a thoughtful, constructive, and multidisciplinary way. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, we try our best and we love having these conversations. Um, I think before we end, I think, Tyler, if you don't mind just telling us, what have you got coming up next? Oh, my goodness. Well, I recently had a show on Netflix come out called Life After Death. I travel the country and do group readings. Now we're at 32 cities uh, in a single year. So I feel so thankful to be able to connect to people, not only on UFO Twitter, I'm on Instagram, all on socials. And it's so special to be able to hear all the different approaches and beliefs and I feel really thankful to even have been considered today. So thank you for having me, yeah. Katie and Eve. Same. Ple pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank yeah. you both. For, We're for grateful you, you both do. took the time. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and to everybody in the live chat, thank you so much for being here. Really, it always means the world to us to, to have you here, uh, showing your support, asking such brilliant questions, and just, yeah, just, just being here is enough. So thank you so much. Um, Gary and Tyler, if you don't mind just hanging around, we'll just have a two minute debrief afterwards, mm -hmm. guys. Thank you again. I'm going to be back next week with Dr. David Clark. Please tune in then, look at all the social medias for the dates and times. But for now, thank you once again, Tyler, Gary, and of course, Katie. And we will see you all soon. Take care, thanks everybody. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>